All right, welcome class to part two of our chapter two, The Chemical Context of Life. I hope you enjoyed part one. Hope you found it informational. And let's get started on chapter, on the part two here of chapter two. We finished off talking about valence electrons. Remember, valence electrons are those electrons in the outermost shell of an, L of an atom. And those are the ones that are not bonded to anything, and they're kind of just floating around there. Now, elements, they don't really float around there because elements, what they will do in order to prevent having these valence electrons that are unpaired, they will go ahead and pair up with, or they'll bond with another element. And one of the ways they can do that is through a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are when, ele when elements are, when they share electrons with, them, with each other. And, uh, and they do so, again, to, to establish that full outer shell. That is so important, and it causes them to be stable when they have that full outer shell. So we will talk about covalent bonds a little bit later. And uh, one other thing, your book talks about single bonds and double bonds and molecular structure and uh, different, different terms there. I encourage you to look at those and um, be familiar with those in a little bit more detail. There's a new term that you're probably unfamiliar with. It's called electronegativity. Electronegativity is just basically the attraction that an, an element has for electrons. And it all has to do with those valence electrons in their outer shell. Now, this chart here does a good job of kind of showing you elect electronegativity values. And if you'll notice here, as you go from left to right on the chart, the values tend to increase. And as you go from the bottom to the top, they increase. So you end up with these elements over here in the upper right-hand corner are your ones with the highest electronegativity value, like nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And um, so if you look at these elements, let's take fluorine, for example, here. Okay, So fluorine has an atomic number of 9. So therefore, it has 9 electrons. So it will have 2 electrons in its very first shell. And then in its second shell, it will have, if you take nine, subtract two, obviously you end up with seven. So there's two there, there's two there, that's four, and six, and then you know, this just leaves one electron out of here by itself. So fluorine, just having this one electron in its outermost shell has a strong attraction for electrons because it wants to have a full outer shell. And so it will have a strong pull for other electrons from other elements. So therefore, it has a very high electronegativity value. Some of these elements over here, like lithium and sodium, they, in their outermost shell, they only have one electron. So they don't have a strong pull. It's easier for them to lose that one electron than it is to pull in seven. So they have a very low electronegativity value. Therefore, they'll oftentimes, they'll actually lose their electrons. And we'll talk about that later. But um, I just wanted you to be familiar with this term, electronegativity and uh, we will talk about it more later as we go on. Now there are two types of covalent bonds that I want you to be familiar with. Um, remember covalent bonds is when they share electrons, but there's two ways they can share them. And it all has to do with that electronegativity value. When elements uh, have a very different electronegativity value, they don't share their electrons equally because the, the element that is a, has a higher electronegativity value will have a tendency to pull the electrons more closely to it, where the element that has a lower electronegativity value has a tendency to get the ele electrons pulled away from it because it doesn't have that strong pull toward it. So and when, they, when they share them unequally, that is considered a polar covalent bond. Sometimes we'll call them a polar molecule. Water is a good example of that. Water, whenever you look at water molecules, the, the electrons are not shared equally between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Oxygen has a very high electronegativity value. It's over here on the chart. Uh, it's way, it's right here. So it's about 3.5 looks like. And then hydrogen over here is about 2.1. So when they share electrons, they don't share them equally. Electrons will spend most of their time closer to the oxygen than they will the hydrogen. Therefore, they're considered, it's water is considered a polyvalent. I'm sorry. That polyvalent, that's a new term. A polar covalent bond. Uh, when, el when elements share electrons equally, we call those nonpolar. Kind of sounds weird, opposite to what you might think it would be, but actually, nonpolar, they actually share them equally. A good example of that is the bond between carbon and hydrogen. They have a very similar, very similar electronegativity value, 
Therefore, when they share their electrons, they share them pretty equally. There might just be a tadpole one way or the other, but they're pretty much equal. Now, the other type of bonds we want to talk about are ionic bonds. And if you remember from physical science, ionic bonds are when electrons actually transfer electrons, elements actually transfer electrons from one to the other. And um, they don't share them. So they're actually going to give up an electron or they're going to gain an electron. And when they do so, they actually be get a charge and they actually become ions. Therefore, that's where they get the name ionic bond. So let's take a look at the classic example of an ionic bond is with uh, sodium chloride, as you're familiar with, is table salt. Sodium is way left on that periodic table and uh, it only it has actually 11 electrons. So if you look down here at this picture, you'll notice that it has two electrons in its first shell. The second shell is going to have two, four, six, eight, and in its outermost shell it only has one little electron out here. And chlorine over here has an atomic number of 17. Two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, that's 10 total. And then 17 minus 10, that leaves you with seven. So therefore its outer shell has seven electrons. So chlorine has a pretty high electronegativity value. Sodium has a pretty low electronegativity value. What happens is sodium ends up oftentimes losing that electron and because it's very unstable in its elemental form so it will lose that electron so I kinda like to draw this out here if you look at sodium and it has 11 protons and when it loses that one electron in its outermost shell it's left with 10 electrons so if you look at that what kind of charge does that have so this is positive and that's negative it ends up with a a plus one charge right so Oftentimes, sodium will be written like this in a plus. You've probably seen it written that way before. Chlorine over here has 17 protons, and it has, when it gains an electron to have a full outer shell, it has 18 electrons. So let's draw the plus and the minus in here. And then it has a minus one charge. So oftentimes, you'll see chlorine written as a chlorine with a minus. So that Whenever these two elements here have this plus charge and this minus charge, we call them ions. It's probably a familiar term to you. So these ions, there's an attraction. The attraction between the positive ion and the negative ion is called an ionic bond. So that's where these come from. Um, and again, ionic bonds, there's no sharing of electrons. They actually will give up an electron or take in an electron to be stable and to fill fulfill that need to have a full outer shell. So let's move on to the next subject here. Hydrogen bonds is the last type of bond we'll talk about. These are very weak bonds, okay? Hydrogen bonds are very weak. They're very important though, very important to the chemistry of life. And the example we have here, and we mentioned, I mentioned it earlier how, how uh, water is a polar molecule. And if you look at this example, water has, uh, but when you look at this covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen's more highly electronegative, highly electronegative than hydrogen, therefore when they share electrons they do not share them equally, so therefore water is this polar molecule. So what you're left behind here was with is this partial charge. It's not a complete charge like an ion, it's just a partial charge. And so oxygen has this partial negative charge right here, if you can see that. And, and that's because of their stronger electronegativity value pulling those electrons to it. Hydrogens, therefore, have a partial positive charge. So there's this weak attraction between the partial negative and a partial positive of, between the oxygen and the hydrogens of two separate water molecules. And that causes these, these are called hydrogen bonds. We will talk more about them in chapter three. Just want to introduce them to you in this chapter. They talk about them real briefly and um, there's kind of a weak bond but um, very important. So let's continue on here. Molecular shape and function is very important in biology. The shape of a molecule plays such a major role in the function of that molecule. They give us an example, they give you an example in the book of this, these two molecules. You have, um, I think it was an endorphin Okay, endorphins are things that your brain, uh, your body produces that gives you that good feeling of, uh, of happy and all that. You've heard of endorphins before. And it can help mask pain, things like that. 
And this one over here is actually morphine, which is a synthetic drug that does the same type of thing. It will make you feel good and, and hide and mask the pain that you might be feeling. And if you look at these two molecules, see how similar these, this one part of them, oops, the one part here is. And um, what happens here is your brain has these receptors where these, this little part of the molecule will bind to it. And they fit right here like a lock and key. And, uh, and if you'll notice, your brain, you know, your body naturally produces these endorphins where in these morph the morphine, if you take this drug, other drugs too, or, or can do, have the same thing, heroin, things like that, they bond to those same receptors on your brain and will give you that same feeling. Um, it can be bad though, because those and obviously there's other problems associated with these. And oftentimes what your body will do is stop making the natural endorphins whenever you're when you're taking these and when you when you stop taking these you know what happens people have uh, problems and and they go through withdrawals and things like that that's because their body stops producing these natural endorphins so they have to learn how to kind of start making them again so this plays an important role in um, your body molecular shape and function we'll, we'll definitely talk about that more as we go throughout the year the last thing I want to talk about here is chemical reactions. These should be familiar with you. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time with these, and uh, don't worry, we're not going to be balancing any chemical reactions. I'm sure you did a lot of that last year, but uh, just want you to be familiar. I want to write. I want to, I want to give you a, an example of a chemical reaction, one that's probably the most famous one in uh, biology. Is this one here? I'm going to write it out for you. We have. Oops, I wrote that wrong. Let me clear that out. Let me start over. Six CO two plus six H two O yields C six H twelve. That's H O six. And one more little thing out here: six O two. And hopefully you've seen that before and you know what that is. If not, don't worry. We will talk a bunch about it this year. That is the chemical equation for photosynthesis. Okay photosynthesis and uh, of course we know that is very important to us and oh, I can't draw my S there there we go but uh, this is a good example of a chemical reaction. chemical reactions take place constantly in your body in all organisms body and it's the making and breaking of chemical bonds and what happens here there's the breaking of the bonds between the carbon and the oxygen and the hydrogen and the oxygen end up yielding these two uh, products. So a couple th terms here I want you to be familiar with. Reactants are everything on the left side of the arrow and over here are your products. And so that's some of the main things you want to be familiar with the chemical reaction. This example here, carbon dioxide plus water yields glucose and oxygen. And um, this is a chemical reaction. The opposite of this is cellular respiration which we'll talk more about later. And it's just kind of, you can almost take this and stick the arrow the other way and you get cellular respiration. So, but you'll learn more about that later. Uh, plenty about it. So this kind of concludes this uh, chapter two. Hopefully you found it informational and we will pick up next time on chapter three on water.